welcome everyone. My name is Heidi Enloe and I'm the case manager here at After Abortion. We are so grateful that you made time to attend our quarterly facilitator training today. I'll tell you what, y'all, this is going to be a terrific session today. Number one, we have so many of our team here present to participate in these role plays. And we all feel like this is a really real kind of way to see how these scenarios play out. We're going to work through the changing landscape of abortion healing. In the words of the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who said, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. See, we simply can't do what we've always done. We have to grow and change because the world we're working in is changing. Mm -hmm. So let's talk today about how it's changing and how we can intentionally change to better navigate. One way we have heard from our line and uh, from providers that we work with, that the clients are not in a place to acknowledge their abortion. And therefore, walking them through forgiveness has been more of a challenge for facilitators. So that's one thing. Another thing is getting clients to even show up for a group. And I see a lot of that on the men's side, especially. We've heard from providers that they're having these great, engaging conversations, and then they get them all set up for a group and then nothing. So today, we're going to walk through some scenarios to what is taking place in the landscape of abortion healing. Mm -hmm. Our line has seen an increase of clients with less than three months removed from their abortion, reaching out for help. They're dealing with two things, right? Healing physically from their abortion and now the emotions that are very, very loud. And keep in mind that the, the variant here is that these aren't people who've had 25 years to process their emotions after abortion and to find so, some sort of understanding about them or reflection about them. These are, are clients that are pretty near to it. So today we're going to walk through two scenarios. One is a scenario of a group and they'll be talking and walking through anger and forgiveness. Now, please know we understand that by the time a facilitator gets to the chapter on anger and forgiveness, there may be an awareness of a participant who may struggle in this area. Our goal in sharing this is how a facilitator can best approach it. Then the next scenario will be how to meet someone where they are. Once they share that they are struggling after an abortion, both of these scenarios can be for women or men's groups and can help a man or a woman in the process. Greg, thank you so much for kind of setting up the expectation for us today. One of the things that as Greg and I prepared for this came to mind for this first scenario is we must seek first to understand. And so as we're going to begin to walk through this first scenario, we've heard it's really hard if they can't acknowledge anger. It's really hard if we can't acknowledge that they need forgiveness. So we want to encourage everyone here to seek first to understand. And the language that we say often is stay curious in this process. Ivy's going to help set us up to tag our speakers for this scenario. And we're going to go through the two scenarios. We're going to do it the wrong way. And then we're going to step into the correct way. Feel free as we're walking through these scenarios. If you have a question that comes up, please place it in our chat box. We're going to have Q&A once we finish the wrong way. And that'll be your time to be able to have a question kind of talk through. We're going to have the Q&A once we finish both the scenarios. I think Ivy has us all set. So you ready, ladies, to get this first scenario started? Hey, ladies. I know key three can be a little heavy as we're talking about freedom from anger through forgiveness. What I've seen is that sometimes women after abortions can be resentful toward themselves, their partner, family members, friends, or even healthcare providers. Have either of you felt this way after your abortion? Well, I don't know if it's really recent, but I definitely felt alone when I told my partner how I was feeling when we got pregnant. I just felt like he was completely non-emotional and he really just left me to make the plans for us on my own. Mm. Yeah. So, man, I, I can relate to, for me, it was my girlfriend. It was really the same way though. Almost like this is your problem, not mine, is what she kept saying to me, well, she may not have said it, but that's what I was feeling. And I just kept asking her looking for a place for somebody to listen to me. And I just really needed a friend. Every time I went to her and she just kept saying, it's your decision. It's your decision. I can't tell you what to do, oh, man. She's been my friend since middle school. And I just sat there and cried. I, I just, there was nothing. It was so hard. I'm so sorry. 
both of you had an experience like that from people that it sounds like you really trusted and needed in this moment. Mm -hmm. You know, resentment forms from an unmet expectation. In your cases, wanting your partner and your friend to respond to your pregnancy and the situation differently than they did. And resentments unmet can begin to fester and create anger. That is why key three is so important for our healing journey. Do you guys feel anger at your partner and best friend? I mean, I guess now that you ask, yeah, I, I do. I, I do life with him every single day and we had our whole life planned out. And then this one time I truly needed him to be there for me and he just left me to fend for myself. So yeah, I am upset with him. Heidi, how about you? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I really need to think through this a little bit more. Okay. This can be a lot to unpack. Do you have any resentments? Do either of you have any resentments towards yourself? Why would I have it toward myself, Karen? Well, that maybe you should have thought it through more, spoken up to your partner about your feelings or your friend about your feelings or anger that you may have made the wrong decision. My anger is toward my partner. I had to make this hard choice and it was the right choice for me. But I just feel like the least that he could have done was take me to my appointment and he couldn't even do that for me. I know this can be a lot, so just bear with me. Key three is on releasing the anger to create the space to receive forgiveness. Often the first place we need to start is within ourselves. For me, I had to own my mistake. I was so angry after my abortion. I could not believe what I did and I wanted my baby back so bad. I got angry with myself. That anger blocked me from walking into my forgiveness. I did not think I was worthy of forgiveness because I made these bad decisions. But once I released my anger and allowed myself to forgive myself, I was able to find so much hope. I want that for you. Karen, I didn't make a mistake. This is what I needed for me. But my best friend really hurt me. So I guess my question is, is that okay? Yeah, I mean, wherever you are right now has got to be okay, right? But I would also encourage you, Heidi, really to reflect on your own anger towards you. I'm telling you, it's in there. I mean, I get that you have that anger towards yourself, Karen, but I need to focus and work through the anger with my partner. That's it. So guys, that was the wrong way. And that may have been really hard to watch. I'm telling you, nobody's showing up next week for group. if <laughs> You do it that way. Yeah. And so just keep in mind the shifting that's happening, you know, less than three months removed from our abortion. Now we're going to take a breath. Now we're going to walk into the correct way. Hey, ladies, thanks for being here. I know key three can be a little heavy because it's about freedom from anger through forgiveness. And that can be a heavy subject for some of us. Do you think that sometimes after abortions, women can be resentful toward themselves, their partner, family members, friends, or even the providers, the abortionists? Have either of you felt this way after your abortion? Well, I don't know if it's recent, but I really felt alone when I told my partner how I was feeling when we got pregnant and he was just completely non-emotional and he really just left me to make this decision and the plans for us all by myself. Yeah, totally. I can relate, Amanda. My girlfriend was the same way. Almost like, this is your problem, not mine. I can't tell you how much, you know, I don't know if she actually said that, but it was just, I felt it. And it was like, I, I'm here to listen if you need a friend. I was like, whatever. You know, so every time I asked her, what should I do? It was just like, it's your decision. It's your decision. And so it was hard. She's been my best friend since middle school. And I just sat and cried my eyes out. There was nothing. Yeah. I'm so sorry, ladies. I'm just so sorry. First of all, let me thank you for being so transparent and sharing that with us because I know this is hard. You know, and both of you experienced something hurtful from people that it sounds like you really trusted, right? I just want to explain that resentments form from an unmet expectation, wanting your partner and your friend to respond to you differently than they did. And resentments unmet can begin to fester and create anger. That's why key three is so important for our healing journey. Do either of you feel anger at your partner or, or your best friend? I know you said a little bit about that, Amanda. 
Yeah. I mean, now that you asked, yeah, I do life with him every day and we planned our whole life out. And the one time I truly needed him to help me and to be there for me, he just left me to fend for himself. So yeah, I am upset with him. And that's okay. That's okay. Heidi, how about you? I don't know, Karen. I think I just need to think through that a little bit more. It can be a lot to unpack. I'm going to ask you a question here. So I just want you to be open for it. I'm not saying that you should be, but I know that I experienced this. So do any of you have resentments towards yourself? Why would I have it toward me? It's common. It's very common for women, especially to become very angry with themselves after an abortion. You know, you can't go back and change it, even if you wanted to. Have either of you felt that at all? And it's okay if you haven't. I just feel like I made the choice that I needed to. And right now, the anger that I'm feeling is really toward my partner and it's beginning to impact our life. And I need to learn how to begin to forgive him. Amanda, thanks so much for sharing that. You know, anger really can impact a relationship. It happens very often after abortion. It's, it's really common. So know that you're not alone in this, okay? The step you took today, acknowledging the anger towards your partner is huge, huge. Together, we can talk through how forgiveness works next. How do you feel about that, Amanda? Sounds good. Okay. And how about you, Heidi? I don't know, maybe, you know, but for me, I just need to get my best friend back. She's been a part of my life since middle school. And now there's just nothing. I think I'm allowing the anger to kind of divide us a little bit. So I think for me, that's, that's where I am right now is I am letting that affect my relationship with her. Thanks so much for sharing that, Heidi. That's a really big step for you to become aware of that, right? That that could be a roadblock between the two of you. And I can hear how important your relationship with your best friend is. So I just want you to know I heard you. And sometimes there's a lot of things that go on around our abortion experience, right? And sometimes it's hard to focus on so many areas at one time. So when and if you feel ready, Heidi, to reflect on that anger towards your friend, I'll be here to support you any way that you desire. Is that okay with you? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I'll see you guys next week. Great job, ladies. Our scenario is done, guys. We're back in the real life. We're not actors anymore. We wanted to take some time and kind of switch it up. So the wrong and the right way. And, and really the big why, we have heard, as Greg said, from our providers, this is something that's taking place. And when you're less than three months removed from your abortion or even five months removed, five years removed from your abortion, Knowing the right place to start can be hard. After assessing with providers in our own lines, this felt really relevant. We want to take time to allow some Q&A. And this may have been hard to hear and just know that we're here and, and we want to make a safe place to ask questions. So we're going to untag our speakers and then we're going to step into um, some Q&A. Ivy, do we have any questions? I had a client share, she knew she made the right decision, but had a huge amount of relief. So my question is, don't they need to admit they made the wrong choice to walk into forgiveness? I'd like to answer that, Heidi, if I can. I want to say a couple of things. One, healing is a process and things are revealed to us and we admit things and acknowledge things as we move through that process, that journey, right? And we can't make anybody feel something that they don't, mm -hmm. right? So for us to try to, they're going to understand that we have an agenda and they're going to just shut down and not trust us at all. Mm -hmm. What I want to do at, when I'm facilitating a group is get them to talk. I don't need to judge what they're saying to me. I just want them to talk because we know that that secret that we keep keeps us sick. Our secrets keep us sick. It's true, right? It's very true. Us at Support After Abortion don't think that people have to acknowledge that what they did was wrong in order to move forward in the healing process. What you're speaking to is we often hear is I have relief and regret. Exactly. I can be sad and I can be joyful. Yes. Right? Yes. 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 So Greg, do you have any thoughts into that question about we need to admit this step first before we can move on? Yeah, I think the first thing that comes to mind and really just validates what Karen said, support after abortion, we talk all the time about meeting people where they're at and remaining curious. And if we have an, a, an agenda, if we have this idea in our mind of what their healing path should look like and what order the steps should come in, the question we have to ask ourselves then is, are we really serving that person or are we serving our own agenda? 
So no, I don't think it has to come in any particular order. I think that if we're open to the conversation, if we remain curious, and if we truly listen to who they are and what they're telling us they need, because a lot of people, right when they enter into a healing environment or a healing pathway, and, and I know from my own experience, they're probably not even fully sure what they feel yet. So what Karen said, just getting them to talk and listen and really listen to what they're saying. I think that's the only way you do it. When they get to the place where they feel a certain kind of way about it, then they'll get there. We just have to be there and walk with them. Thank you for sharing that, Greg. And I don't know if it was caught in the scenarios the the wrong way you saw Karen sharing more of her own story. Well, this is why it's important. This is what I went through and this is what has helped me. And that will at times, what Greg just said, can lead to our agenda. So as a facilitator remaining neutral and allowing the conversation, staying in the driver's seat and seeing where they're ready to go first. So as you saw with Amanda and and Heidi, they needed to work through the anger of abandonment from their deep relationships. So just keeping that in check, you know, I have wandered off track. So just know we can always get it back on track. Thanks probably not with those questions. Ivy, do we have another question? Is it a different approach based on the time from the abortion experience? Mm, that's a good question. So I think I'll jump in first and then we'll see what Greg and Karen have to say. So everybody's grieving process is different. You may have somebody 25 years removed and you first engage them and it's as if it was yesterday. I would encourage to stay curious, ask the right questions. I don't know if it's necessarily always a time frame, but assessing if you're a, a, a pregnancy resource center, what are the questions that you're asking on that referral and on that intake form? How are you assessing if they're group ready? So for me, I want to lead, I want to focus on that aspect of this question. You may have that person that's one week or less and you have your 25 year removed. There's going to be different things showing up for them. What I've observed on our line, the 25 year removed person is able to explain things. This is what I'm feeling. This is what happened. You have your three months or less removed. They're focused on one area. That's been what I've observed on the line. I don't know if that helps answer the question. That's my perspective. Um, Karen or Greg, any insight into that question? I think they present completely differently. You know, the person that's 25 years removed has learned how to cope, Mm -hmm. right? Not that that's healthy, but they've learned how to cope. And that person that's only a week removed or a month removed is highly emotional. That's why they come to us. It's not that they think that they made the wrong decision. They're probably pro-choice. They're just emotional. Their relationship has fallen apart. They're not doing good at work. And they want to know why their life has changed so much as a result of a simple procedure. Right? And so they feel deceived. Yes. They're angry. They're really angry. And again, we can't make them feel anything that they don't, but if they come to us and they're telling us those things, we need to be present and listen to them and normalize those feelings for them because it's very common. Whatever they're feeling, right? Right. Not what we think they should feel, but whatever their emotions they're presenting or acknowledging. I think that there's a different, like an almost sense of urgency when somebody's really close to the abortion event. When you have the reflection of decades and you've sorted through the narrative of what happened and how I felt and all those kind of things, there's a a different level of urgency there. But I think the mechanisms are the same. Mm -hmm. And Heidi, you said it. We still have to remain curious. Mm -hmm. We still have to be present where they're at right then without any kind of goal or agenda. I keep saying that over and over because I know in my past and, and early recovery life for myself, I've made those mistakes where... I felt this urgency, like I need to fix this. I need to come up with a solution. I need to whatever for them. And I don't, I just need to be curious and non-judgmental and open and let them tell me what they need. Yeah. So what you heard, just to recap a little bit, somebody further removed can share a little bit more about what they're feeling. They can understand a little bit more at times. And then the one that's closer to that abortion procedure, there's like, why is my world falling apart? I don't understand. This is supposed to be easy. Go back to work. And then you have the person who's further removed. Yeah, my marriage fell apart. My kids don't talk to me. There's, I understand that all this stuff has happened. I just need support. 
I think that fits what Karen and Greg are saying. Ivy, do we have one more? Yes. If forgiveness is a heavy topic, would you recommend we spend an extra week on forgiveness in our group? Stick to the expectation of what you set up for your group. You're now halfway in. So to sit there and say, you know what, we're going to change directions. We're going to add an extra week to this. My suggestion would be stick to the plan. If you have one or two that may be struggling, that may be a high conversation. If this is heavy for some of us sitting here, I want to make sure that you know you can reach out to me. I'm here if you need to talk more through this. Sticking to what the expectations are at the beginning it is really important. What about you, Karen? I'm going to piggyback on that. Adding an extra week midstream like that, to me, seems like an agenda, mm -hmm. right? You're going to add an extra week because you want those people that maybe aren't at that place of forgiveness to come around. That's not what we want to do. We want to meet them where they are and, and understand that this is just the beginning of their process. This is not the end. They don't have to do it within the six or eight weeks that they are with you, but have plans available for them. What are next steps for them? You're going to learn a lot about these people when you spend six to eight weeks with them about what's going on there in their lives and the trauma that they've experienced. And you're going to have next steps for them. So this does not end with you. We're planting the seed. We're not harvesting the field. What about you from a men's perspective? If a guy said this in your group, if you were assessing this and this is an immense group. Is so the short way to respond, Heidi, to both you and Karen is ditto and ditto. I agree 100%. When you set an expectation, as you said, when you set a format and you say, we are going to do this on this night for six weeks, I don't think you can change it. If you're mindful and present, then you will take the opportunity to have a conversation with that guy offline. I think we have to honor their time that they committed and not mess with that. So our first thing here was knowing how to lead a conversation if somebody's not ready to walk into something. Karen, thanks for being a part of our Q&A. We're going to get ready for our second scenario. Greg, you want to set us up for the second scenario? Yeah. So our next role play will be on setting up expectations. Uh, we heard that from our providers are having amazing introductions and they're getting men and women connected for healing, but then they're not showing up. As you've heard at the beginning, the abortion healing landscape is changing and we must change and shift with it. So now we're going to see how to slow down the conversation. As we're connected to someone for abortion healing, keep in mind that at times our own agenda will show up and this could be why some people are not showing up. We're going to have Greg and Niles. And remember, these can be for women or men. So stay open because this can also be for a women's intake process. Remember, feel free to put your questions in the chat box. We're going to do the wrong way, and then we're going to step into the correct way, and then we're going to set up our Q&A time at, after they're done. Ready, Niles? All right. Hey, Niles, what brings you in today? I've been struggling a bit and saw you guys help support men who have gone through an abortion. First off, I want to commend you, Niles, for taking a step for help. That takes courage and strength. Now, I can get you set up with some materials for the group. And if you'll hang on for just a second, I can get you a brochure that talks about the dates and times for the group. Uh, So me and my ex found out we were pregnant two months ago, actually. And at the time, we weren't in a good place in our relationship. We were actually in the middle of breaking up. Then we found out she was pregnant, and it was just a very messy situation. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. So we meet starting two weeks from today, right here at seven o'clock each evening. The group lasts for about seven weeks. So if you have any questions between now and then, shoot me a text or email. Otherwise, I'll just see you then. Yeah. I'm not really sure. Ever since we decided to have an abortion, my mind has been all over the place. I worry a lot about her as well. I've never really struggled like this before. I hear you. What you're feeling can be normal for men who have experienced abortion. Here's how we can help you. Again, I can get you set up with the materials for an abortion healing support group. And if you'll hang on for just a second, I can get you a brochure, talks about the dates and times for the group. Dude, I'm just excited for you. It took me years to know I needed help for my abortions, but this is what you need. This will be a game changer for you. Um, okay. Okay. All right, that was the end. Back out of character for a minute. <clears throat> Heidi, jump in if you want, but reminding everybody that was the wrong way. I kind of chuckling because, I mean, it was so wrong. So now we'll just take a pause. Niles and I will kind of reset our brains, and we are going to jump into the correct way.
Ready, Niles? Of course. Hey, Niles. What brings you in today? Hey, I've been struggling a bit and saw you guys help support men who have gone through an abortion. First of all, I want to commend you, Niles. Taking a step for help isn't always easy. But we can help you find a path to healing that makes sense for you. Do you mind me asking when your abortion was? Okay, so me and my ex found out we were pregnant about two months ago. We were not in a good place in our relationship, actually. We actually began to end our relationship. Then we found out we were pregnant, and it was even more of a mess. I am so sorry, Niles, that you had to go through all that. Well, I obviously was a part of an abortion, but it's just been bugging me lately, and I can't really explain it. I get that. But let me ask you, have you talked to anybody about the abortion experience? Only with my ex. We didn't share with many about the abortion or that we were even pregnant, actually. Well, Niles, for some, trying to walk through what is bugging us from an abortion can be hard. So you're not alone in this, okay? That's what I want you to get first. But I'm also available to listen if you'd like to share anything else about the experience. Not right now, but thanks. I don't even know what I can do, actually. Well, the good news is we do have options. Can I tell you what we offer here to help men who have gone through an abortion? Sure. Terrific. It, there are a variety of different options to help support men. Often it can feel a little off or even scary to even begin any of these. But remember, it's one step at a time. So one thing we offer for abortion support for men is one-on-one -on -one peer support. This is meeting with a guy usually once a week, and together working through a book or a booklet. The next option is similar, only it's in a group setting with other men who are sorting out their own abortion stories and issues. That kind of group setting run times vary uh, depending on the resource you use, but you'll know before you start or commit to a group so you can decide if it makes sense for you and your schedule. And then the other thing is we can also help you get connected to a therapist, if that makes sense to you. The one-on-one -on -one thing in the group settings, Niles, are led by a mentor or a facilitator, not a licensed therapist. So if you'd rather explore clinical options, we can find that for you as well. Any questions so far? That's a lot to take in. Yeah, I know. It, it can be a lot. And I really don't want to overwhelm you today. How about this? I'll provide you with some resources about the options that we went over and, and discussed. And then I can check on you in a day or two and we can go over any questions you may have at that point. Does that sound good? I'd appreciate that. That sounds good. All right. Terrific. Would you prefer paper resources or would you rather me text you the info? Text, please. I don't want my roommates to see any of this. Yep. Completely understand. Let me get your contact information. And remember, this is all new and the uncertainty you're feeling is common. But we will find a path forward that works best for you. Okay. Okay. I'll wait to hear from you. Great job, guys. Great job. You were able to watch how we did an intake on somebody to assess if they're group ready. And again, we were hearing from providers. We're having these amazing conversations. We're engaging and then they don't show up. And so I love when we were practicing this, Karen goes, are they having great conversations or are they assuming they're having great conversations? That was actually a perspective for me to receive because I'm like, no, they're having these great conversations. By slowing down the conversation, which is something we've had to do on our support line, we are allowing them time to process this. And remember, they may be only three months removed from their abortion and they're trying to really unpack a lot or they're coming to you for the first time and, and they're, you know, Niall said, something's bugging me. They don't even know by Greg slowing down the conversation, it's allowing him to be able to really assess what's going on a little bit more. So great, great job, guys. We're going to go into some Q&A. If I could just jump in real quick, what I, I really want folks to understand with that second scenario is that what I tried to do with Niles is give him the opportunity, invite him here. And I also try to model boundaries. Can I ask you, do you mind talking about, but I didn't push him. A guy's natural propensity, even when he intentionally and on purpose opens up a little bit, is it feels a little uncomfortable and icky. And then we just going to shut that right down. So 
I, I, I tried to make it a very non-threatening, non-pushy kind of space. And, and I think that we all need to focus on that too, is uh, allowing a person we're talking to the opportunity yes. to share and talk more, but not make them feel like they're forced, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to take some time for some Q&A. So Ivy, do we have any questions that have come up in our chat box? I have one question. And I think if we could just go a little bit deeper on understanding how soon would you follow up with them after meeting and providing the info? I know you talked about boundaries, Greg, but maybe we could just go a little bit deeper as to questions we're asking to establish those boundaries. So for me, what I did with, with Niles and what I would do in that situation is I set the expectation. Mm. I'll reach back out in a day or two. I tend to lean on the side of being a little more specific. Like today it's Wednesday, right? I would say to him, I get these resources to you and then I'll catch up with you Friday. See if you have any questions. This time of day, usually good for you. That way he knows. Greg's going to call me on Friday at noon and see if I've got any questions. There's a lot of dynamics to why that's beneficial. We don't have to get into now, but it is. And one of the main things to the question, Ivy, is that, I am giving him the opportunity to say no. Mm -hmm. Friday didn't work. Don't call me, shoot me a text, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm telling him what I intend to do and asking his permission to do that. I think, Greg, to add a little bit more to that, asking, do you want to text? Do you want to email? Do you want a phone call? And then letting them know. So if email is the option, be sure to check the spam because my email may go to your spam. And then if it's a text, Give them your number so they know what number to be looking for. And often they may say, remind me who this is. That's normal. So often you may not be the only person they're connecting with. And I think that's important to remember. They're just searching for somebody to respond to them. They may also be connecting with somebody else in your community. So it's okay if they say, remind me who this is. It's not that they forgot about you. Trust me, it, it's not because you supported them. It's just allowing them to remember who it was. We all remember when we're in that high emotional place, it can mm -hmm. be hard to remember the details. So set that up a little bit more with those expectations. They may have more questions once you do that check-in and that is normal. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for that. Ivy, do we have any other questions? I have a, another great question. What if they don't respond at the time of follow-up? <laughs> Where do we go? That's a good one. I really want to first reflect within your own policies. So what are your policies on follow-up? Do you have a policy for how to follow up with a, a client? I would recommend if you don't have that procedure, it would be great to assess with your team. What would be a, an appropriate follow-up? I can share what our line does. We have somebody who we've had this great first engagement with, and we say, hey, we're going to check in on you next week. We've set up the expectations and then say, we checked in and there's no response. We will schedule one more check-in with that client. We're not going to continue chasing. We're going to honor the silence is what I like to call it. And after two attempts, we stop. The really neat thing is, and I think for me, the most important thing for me to remember, they know you're there. So if they do, as I've heard some people say, they ghosted us, just know that they now know that you are there. For me though, and our team, we must honor this silence and respect it. Greg, what have any thoughts on what do we do if they're not responding? Well, first of all, I do what the team does. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that straight. But yeah, it, what you said in honoring the silence, another way to say that is respect their boundary. I learned this a long time ago in the healing and recovery world that I, it's not my job to chase you, to chase you with recovery, to try to make you want to do my thing or whatever. So yeah, two follow-ups. Now, me personally, before I became a member of the Support After Abortion team, I would do two and then one month out. I'd hit them one more time just to see if some dust had settled in their lives. Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't, but it's not our job to make sure somebody gets healed. It's our job to offer the opportunity for healing. And if I could add something to that, Heidi, <clears throat> what I used to do, and I don't know what we do now because I don't work on the after abortion line, but I used to let them know that this was going to be the last time that I reached out to them because I didn't want to bug them. 
right? If we just go silent on them, they could think that we're ghosting them. So I always used to explain that I've reached out to you a couple of times. I know how emails can get lost and messages get overlooked, but this is the last time I'm going to reach out. This is how you can reconnect with us, et cetera. So I would explain it a little bit. Yes. And so we do that. So I think that's a great thing to add. And for me, I let them know, Hey, we're here when you're ready. And then normalizing that. And that's something Greg did um, a little bit in the second run through, it, it can feel scary. It can feel uncomfortable. Are you setting that up for success for that expectation for that man or woman sitting in front of you? It can be scary walking into a room where you don't know anybody. It can be scary turning on your camera, not knowing what to expect. And so some of that is very normal. It is normal to talk to somebody and then feel better. You know, so maybe when you check in on them in a week, they do actually feel some support. I talk to somebody, it feels as heavy. And so there could be a number of reasons why they do not respond. So don't always assume it's a negative response. Karen, that's great feedback. Setting that expectation up. Hey, just know we're here when you feel ready. You have the information and just know you can reach out anytime to talk through what this looks like for you. Great, great add on for that, Karen. You have to be comfortable with the unknown, right? Which is something we talk about in the organization a lot. When we're out in different places and we're talking to people, you don't know if you're going to hear from them again. Mm -hmm. Real quick example, a year and a half ago, a guy comes up to me in an event. He he shares a story and and we talk for a little bit and we're going to connect. I reached out to him a few times and he, as Heidi said a minute ago, ghosted me. Mm -hmm. Well, a year later, I'm at the same event, same church, same city, same everything. And this cat walked up to me and started talking. See, he had learned a bunch in that year. He had taken advantage of some of the resources. He just wasn't ready to talk. So now we talk about once every two or three weeks. It it took him time to find his own pace and his own peace, right? About how to go forward with this. Mm -hmm. We have to be comfortable with that. Yeah. And so these are just very, very minor, few things that we've seen with some of this change in landscaping for abortion healing. And we haven't even unpacked all of it. It's funny as Greg and I were assessing what this training was going to be on. It was actually quite hard for me. There's a lot that's taking place. There's a lot that's moving. There's a lot that has shifted for all of us. These just felt the most relevant And so we're going to continue this. We'll walk through more of this in quarter four. We were able to assess somebody in the first scenario on meeting them where they are. Forgiveness can be a big topic. Being able to own and acknowledge something we all know is freeing. At times, the men and women that we're serving, they're just not there. And that's okay. So we were able to walk through that a little bit. Then with Greg and Niall, they really helped slow that conversation down for us. I want to encourage all of us, remember a time, and we've all been there, that we were in this place in a situation that was really hard for us. The emotions are so much. How do you then begin to step into everything at one time? And so by slowing down that conversation, you get to just start something with that man or woman. And they can then decide if they're ready for it. It was a lot to unpack today and you guys did amazing. So I want to make sure we have a little bit of space here. We have one or two more questions, Ivy. Do we have anything else related to either of the scenarios that we did? I do have another one that came in. Forgiveness is really the key. Would you suggest that we share our own story to help share the importance of forgiveness? We touched on this a little in our scenario, Karen and the the wrong way did, this is what worked for me. This is what worked for me. I feel like we have maybe a little bit of a pattern going on. You know, what's the motive? What's your why? Really assess, am I sharing my story to really get them on my side to see that this is something that's going to just bring them so much once they walk through it? Or are you helping them to understand it a little bit differently, which is what Karen did in the second scenario. She shared a very short snippet and what really was something that helped her a little bit. And then she paused and she asked more questions. So I would really assess that. What's your why? Is there an agenda in sharing? Well, 
this was what was amazing for me. And remember, we hit this, I believe, in quarter one. We're not there to be their biggest fan. We're there to facilitate what is best for them. So for me, I would just do a self-check. Am I doing it because I sincerely think there's a reason for it? And if so, how can you shorten that experience and then pull it back to them? At times, they've never talked to somebody who's had an abortion loss. They've never talked to somebody who's gone through healing. So doing it in a way that is more educational would be my recommendation. Karen, pipe up if you have anything you want to share, because I I can see you moving your head in there. (laughs) Yeah, like in that first scenario, I totally had an agenda. I believed that I had to express my anger and receive forgiveness as a result. And I needed to prove, I needed to break their denial, right? If we're trying to break denial, if we're trying to have them recognize something that is going on with them that's hidden, don't do it, Mm -hmm. right? Don't do it. I was trying to convince you that you were angry. I I even said it. It's in there. (laughs) It's in there. You know, just like I I tell everybody that they're codependent to some degree. Greg, how about you? How does this set with a guy's group? Well, it's the same. I mean, my dad, who was in the recovery landscape, not abortion, but in recovery landscape for 46 years before he passed, used to always say, you can't help anybody. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time he said that and I was like, but dad, that's what we're here for. We're supposed to help people. And he said, son, took a sip of his coffee. He said, you're missing the point. Your job's not to help them. Your job's to point them to the path that makes sense for them. Sharing your story, like you said, Heidi, it has to be when it's appropriate Mm -hmm. and for the appropriate reason. If I'm trying to convince you of the truth of what I'm telling you, then I've already missed my mark. Yeah. And so for that reason, I try to keep my sharing of my own stuff to a bare minimum, unless I'm asked a direct question. And then I'll answer the question and try not to go on about it for too long because the focus is him. Mm-hmm. What is he feeling? What does he need to deal with right now? And, and it's happened. You know, a guy will come and he'll start talking about the abortion thing, especially like an event or if somebody sees my truck with a sport after abortion sticker on the tailgate or whatever it happens. I get these conversations. Well, if you talk to them and ask questions and remain curious and actually listen to what they're saying, what you find out is, yeah, he's got this in his past and he knows he needs and wants to deal with it. But right now, and this is a real life example right now, he's tipsy, tipsy toodle is my grandma used to say. So right now we need to talk about why are you drinking, right? But you don't find that out if you're focused on, well, let me tell you what I think you need to do today. Today, you need to acknowledge the whatever, you fill in the blank, right? Only God can heal you. But what I don't know is that he grew up in a church where he was abused. Now, what do I do with that? I I keep saying it over and over. Y'all are probably like, man, this dude's a broken record. But we, we remain curious. We ask questions. We let the question that is answered lead to the next question we have to ask. So we truly know this man or woman and truly understand what their heart's telling us, what they're really feeling. And the last thing I'll say about this, and I've said this over the last few years a lot too, but remember with men, and every time men validate what I'm saying in the chat, so guys don't be bashful. Men often present anger first, right? And we talk and we ask questions. We find out just below that anger is fear. And then we get below that fear and we find out what the, as the kids say, what the real real is, right? And and if we're not remaining curious and if we have an agenda and a a way we think they should go, I think we miss the opportunity to get to the real real. Greg, you just spoke something that we say so often, root versus symptom. And that is very relevant for our groups that we're hosting to help men and women find what they're struggling with. As you heard in the scenario, Amanda, it was anger toward her husband. Heidi was just, I'm missing my friend. So staying curious, root versus symptom. We understand that that's a symptom. What kind of questions are we asking? Just to remain curious with that and sharing our story. I want to ask when you share your story in your groups or on your support line, what are you receiving in response? We've had times our support line clients will say, I'm so sorry you went through that. We went too far. So I would love us to reflect as facilitators, as men and women serving those hurting, 
reflect on a time you shared your story. What was the response from that participant? That will be your answer if you shared too much or if you did it in a way that was supporting them. That's been an eye opener for me. And again, we are impossible to be perfect, each and every one of us sitting here. The really neat thing in our quarter two was learning, we, we may jump out of that driver's seat, but there's always a way to get back into that driver's seat. Mm-hmm. And so I really hope you feel that support today. We're not alone in this. We all have the things that we're adjusting with our client's support. And so this is important that we all sit here together to be able to see what's happening with each other and in the areas that we're serving men and women. Today, I'm grateful that you joined us. These scenarios were taken from some real situations that we shifted around a little bit, but they steamed from real conversations. We hope you'll join us in quarter four. We're excited to continue supporting you guys. Thank you for joining us.